Welcome to Spotlight on E-Women Network. We are the premier success system for women entrepreneurs. So to prove that, I am now dedicating my show to members of E-Women Network who have amazing stories to tell. Stories of success and their often torrential journey to get there. So we have thousands of members to choose from, and I would love to feature all of them, but there's just not enough bandwidth uh, to do that. So the stories you're going to hear on my show are carefully chosen to be jaw-dropping experiences that will inspire others to keep moving, even during the toughest times. Each guest will also offer business tips and strategies that they've cultivated to help you and your business grow and shine in your industry. So this, my first guest uh, today, I'm very excited. Her name is Diane Hoffman, and she has quite a really interesting story to tell. Uh, her business is called Spa Life, and no, it doesn't mean like you're going to go and get your nails done and uh, you know, and toes done, uh, but she's going to, she, it's a, it's a kind of business where she helps you live that kind of spa life. And she also is a new podcast host on our EWN podcast network. And her show is called live your spa life show. And she is a platinum member of eWomen network. So I'm so excited that you're here, Diane. And uh, so welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Phyllis. Uh, so first of all, uh, this first segment where I want to talk to you about, um, you and from whence you came, which is going to be hard for some people to believe because you look <laughs> at you and you're this, this gorgeous creature. You have this business about living your spa life, but you started a very different way. So tell us about your, your, your journey when you were in the, as, uh, in the law enforcement field. So tell us about that. Absolutely. Thanks for asking, Phyllis. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, the work I do, you know, I, I look behind the scenes. And so a lot of people don't know that I was a San Diego police officer for 10 years. And I worked uniform patrol as well as undercover assignments in gangs, narcotics, and vice. So that gave me an insight into a lot of people's homes, mostly when they weren't invited and in times where they were at their worst. So I've literally been in thousands of homes and really was able to see what was going on with people and you know how people show up in the world, how we see each other and how we want to be our best. But you know, behind closed doors, it may not be as pretty and not be the way that we want it to be. So it was during that time that I actually coined the term called clutter awareness, uh, you know, where it's from clutter to drama, and it was the clutter to drama ratio that I came up with, where it was the more clutter that was in people's space, that the more drama they had in their life, the more the police had to come. And so, you know, there was that correlation that had come and, you know, there is a correlation between what's happening in your space and your environment and how happy you are, how effective you are and how it affects you in business. And the reverse is true too, that when you reduce the clutter in your space, you can open up your mind and you can see things from a different perspective. You know, no police has to be coming to your home. And I really saw that there was something here for me to step into. So uh, it's just hard to, to see. It's hard to imagine that for 10 years you were breaking down people's doors, <laughs> arresting people, and seeing the worst of people, and how now you are helping people find the best them, of themselves. I want to go back a little bit more and give us some kind of juicy stories about when you were breaking into people's homes and as a police officer, uh, not as a criminal. Um, and, and, and just like give us, first of all, how did you become a law enforcement officer? I mean, that is not what your parents wanted, expected of you. No. Am I correct? <laughs> no. How did, how'd you get there? Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, my, I remember my dad saying, you know, when I was going to college, you know, I was the oldest of three and my dad really, you know, my parents wanted me to succeed. And, and when I was going to choose a major in college, they were like, okay, are you going to be a doctor or an attorney? Like those were my only choices in the world kind of thing. And so I thought, well, I don't want to be a doctor, but you know, law sounds interesting. So I actually got my degree in criminal justice and I was going to be an attorney. And so I started doing uh, work in my senior year, doing shepherdizing of cases. And I realized that this is not what I wanted to do with my life. But then I was like, well, what do I do with a, a, you know, a criminal justice degree? And some of the guys that I was graduating with were going into law enforcement and invited me to go on some ride alongs. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll, I'll check this out. And so 
I did. And I thought, well, you know, it can't hurt to put in my application and just see what happens. And from the time I put in my application to the police academy, uh, three months later, I was a police officer. I was, you know, in, in the academy. I was starting the process. I had never even held a gun before, before I had started this process. I was 12 years of Catholic school. You know, it was totally out of my knowing and comfort zone and, and all of that. And, you know, at the same time, there was a serial killer that was going on uh, historically. And so I started doing undercover work as a prostitute because we were there to lure him in order to, uh, you know, stop the, the mass killing of, of women because they were targeting prostitutes. So that's why we were out there to identify him. So that was a whole other world of, of prostitution and, and what did that look like? And just my own facade and my own journey of going from being, you know, a mother. And at the time I was a single mother, I was newly divorced. And, you know, I had to show up as this strong police officer in uniform. I had to be like, I knew what I was doing in the street as a, as a prostitute and then go home and be a mom and just Ugh. changing all those roles on just one day and a daily basis. I mean, it was, I was living that epitome, if you will, of showing up in one way, but having all these things happening behind the scenes for myself as well, you know, especially as a, as a single mom and how I was going to make a, you know, make my mortgage payment of, of all things. So just a lot of things going on for myself that I was able to relate to people of how you wanted to be in the world and what was going on behind the scenes and, and how you were feeling and, and not being that sure that you could do what you were set out to do. Well, and, and as a single mother, what you just described is a very dangerous life. I mean, you're living yeah. as a prostitute and Oh my, I, I mean, there's just so many images that are coming to my head right now. And yeah. I just, I, I, it's I, I get that jaw dropping story that I mentioned in my introduction that these are the kind of stories I'm talking about. Mm. I've just got to, you got to take us there. You've got to take us to when you were walking the streets and, and what was that like for you? I mean, can you give us one juicy story? Um, <laughs> and and I, you know, I mean, how did you do that? And I imagine you had to be, go and, and, and convince these men or somehow to go with you, but then right. you don't follow through. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> Well, you know, it's so funny. I mean, a lot of people have like a lot of misconceptions around, you know, prostitution and, and why law enforcement would actually, you know, be involved with that because, you know, frankly, we don't really care who's sleeping with who and, and you know, that's not the part of it. It's really for what we find out information because people that are around prostitution are connected to crime. You know, people who are just getting out of jail, you know, tend to connect with the prostitutes. It allows us when we arrest them to be able to pinpoint a time and place for them so when crime happens in the area, it really helps us solve cases and really connect things that are happening. So, you know, and it attracts a whole different element. So one of the things, I mean, there's such a, a gamut of things that happen when you're on the street. I can remember one of the times, the scary part is, is that, you know, here I am dressed up as a prostitute. I can't have my gun on me. I can't have my radio. I don't have any type of weapon on me. And I have to rely on my detectives who are watching me to see uh, you know, to make sure that they're protecting me. And so I'm relying on other people for my safety. So, you know, that's a whole other aspect. But I remember one of the times I was standing on the corner and this, it, it was almost like a movie set. I had this big Cadillac come around the corner and, you know, these two guys in hats and suits, you know, come out and, you know, they started like, you know, kind of harassing me and asking me like, you know, what are you doing here? Like they were the pimps that owned the corner and they were getting ready to drag me into the car and we had to not, you know, blow my cover. So one of the detectives had actually stepped out and pretended he was my pimp. And we had this whole discussion like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not on the street. And, all this <laughs> <laughs> and just this whole acting that had to happen in the process. Wow. And luckily, you know, they were able to, you know, between the detective who was playing my pimp and the actual pimps just to try and settle the scene to make them go away. Right. So it's just that kind of craziness that was happening. And then just the interaction with the guys who are actually solicit, you know, soliciting me, which we call them Johns. And, you know, there was one night where, because our whole goal is to arrest as many people as possible that night so we can identify them. So there was a night where I actually arrested 34 men that night. 
and the amount, the quick talking, which I know I talk fast anyway. I think maybe it came back from those days. But one of the things that happened was I was standing on the corner and a guy was driving by in his car. And you know that rubbernecking where you're just looking at someone too long? Well, mm -hmm. he was looking at me instead of on the road. And so he crashed into a center <laughs> divide in front of me. <laughs> and the wheel of his car actually came off and was rolling down the street. So he hobbles his car over to the side of the road. And what's crazy about it is he actually got out of his car, came over and still solicited me, even oh, though he my. crashed his car. And I, after I had arrested him and I was you know, in, interviewing him and, and having a conversation, I just said, you know, wasn't it a sign to you? Like what possessed you when you actually crashed your car to come over and still solicit me? And he said, well, I figured I had to wait for a tow truck anyway, so I had time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, don't get in a man's way when he's got, you know, one thing top of mind. <laughs> right, Goodness. right. Wow, that is... That's, I, I don't even know what to say to that. It's, it's just <laughs> unbelievable. It's like, it is. and the fact that you, you did it and you were willing to do it and excited to do it and arrested all the, I mean, that kind of drive, you know, that is, uh, I'm sure you bring that into your, into your business today. No question. So Absolutely. uh, what I want to do is we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to find out how you used some of those uh, things that you learned as, a, as an undercover uh, officer and, and street officer and see uh, specifically how that applies to your business today and how you help others, as you alluded to earlier, unclutter their lives and uh, maybe a few tips on that too. So take a moment and uh, we'll be right back. Okay, we're back now, and I'm speaking with uh, Diane Hoffman, and uh, she is the founder, owner of a business called Spa Life, uh, but we've just been hearing some really wild and crazy stories of her as an undercover officer. Uh, prostitution, yes, but uh, arresting many, uh, many people and um, solving crimes and in the on the streets i mean i I'm, i see a movie i see the movie but only you could play that part because you're also this beautiful poised woman that i could just totally see playing the part but who would play that part for you like in your head could you imagine <laughs> think about what actress would play you Hmm. I <laughs> bet know. you've never been asked that, right? <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I was 25 when I started with the department. So there had to be probably someone new and upcoming that, uh, you know, had kind of that grit about them and, mm -hmm. and but was savvy. So I don't know, maybe there's some, something new for somebody. We'll have to think about it. Maybe some of our listeners might, might have an idea. So <laughs> let's uh, move forward. You, you alluded to earlier uh, in our interview how you... Um, have, it was through this detective work that you became aware of the link between clutter and crime. So how you then, you, you, you take us from you, you decided to leave law enforcement and start your business. Is that, is that the journey that you took or is there some kind of a transition in between? Because it's a pretty big leap. <laughs> you know, it is, it is a leap. And, you know, it was not necessarily, you know, you know, crime sometimes came into play with that. But what I found is that, you know, it was the link that I found was between clutter and drama. You know, sometimes crime was involved in that, but drama was just your life wasn't working. Like, you know, the, the fact that you had to have police come into your home, whether it was, you know, domestic violence or there was break-ins or there was drug use, it was a drama that was associated with their life. So it was the clutter to drama ratio ratio that was happening and that the more clutter, the more you're in, because your environment affects everything. You know, it either pulls you towards your goals and the things that you want to do, or it actually, you know, you know, re repels you and it and keeps you away. So it's really important to look at your environment. So that was the thing that I was able to see in literally being in thousands of homes to really see that your environment 
affected everything. And it didn't have a lot to do with socioeconomic, whether you had a lot of money or, or you didn't have a lot of money. It was what was happening in your home, what kind of systems and structures, what kind of space was actually supporting you to live a productive life. And the people that had a lot of things happening in their space just weren't supporting them in their life. So I started making these connections and really helping people in their space to clear out the clutter, to really clear the things that were happening in their space. And and as I was retiring out of the department, I was being asked to help people create the environment that allowed them to be successful. So there was two things that I was stepping into from a business perspective was looking at people's environment, seeing what was not supporting them because environment affects everything. And so I was looking at, you know, most entrepreneurs and people who are in business, they, you know, they needed to have clarity in their space. They needed to have, you know, a space that supported them. So then I also coined the term that creativity, because we all need to be creative in our business and have the man, sorry, the um, bandwidth to do the things that we need to do. So the creativity craves clarity. So we really need to clear the space so people can be creative, so they can step into and do the big work that they are here to do. But if you're distracted, and I hear, I can already hear a lot of people saying, well, the piles don't bother me, it's not affecting my work, I'm a creative person, I mean, all these type of things. However, subconsciously, our brain gets distracted into other things, and I would even venture as much to say that the lack of focus that people are having these days, I believe is directly related to their environment and not creating an environment that really supports them. And I'm not saying it has to be a sterile environment and you have to clear everything. You want to have those chosen few things that actually inspire you and you're able to utilize to really do, do your work in the world. Yeah, I, I do believe that your environment and is reflective of what's going on. Your external is reflected what's going on internally. Absolutely. I'm hearing you say that we can kind of fake it till we make it, that if you clear and you take action on reducing the clutter in your external life, that then you can focus internally on clearing all the crud that's going on in your head and declutter your, your life personally, business-wise, and, and create some clarity. Am I, am I hearing you correctly? You know, you actually don't have to fake it. I mean, there are scientific proof that, you know, if you create an environment that makes you happy, that supports you, I mean, all the, you know, how you feel in your body, who you're being as a person in terms of your confidence, you know, I always tell people do an experiment, you know, just clear one area. I mean, even if you just empty out your purse, you know, you know, it's like you clear out all the things that you're not using. It's opening up the bandwidth. It's almost like a computer where, you know, if you got too much RAM, you, you move much slower on your computer. It's the same thing with your brain and how you're operating in your business. If you don't have the things that, you know, I, one of my talks that I, I talk about is having productivity and profitability just by clearing your desk and that space. So, you know, it's not even having to fake it. It's actually true and scientific of how you're operating in your space that really makes the difference. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really does. And I even noticed just, I just noticed that for myself that when I leave, before I leave every day, I try to make sure that my desk is, somebody once said, make sure 80% of your desk is clear. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I try to, if even if it's not, like I try to put things in piles, you know, just so when I come in, it's just mm -hmm. not, I'm not hit with a whirlwind. Right. Um, but uh, I also know there's just some people that are inherent, uh, inherently messy. And um, I just feel that there's a, and those people They've got, especially like I look at my children, right? My 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 daughter in particular is always grew up with you know ADD and and I think those kids in particular are it's their brain is so scattered. There's so much going on that they that that's that's the external reflects the internal, mm -hmm. and um and so I think that there's some people that really is not that easy. It, it's very challenging to know even to where to begin. So. So can you give us some tips for those, those of us or those people who are inherently messy? Um, how do they start? Give us, you know, maybe three tips of, that can walk us through their, that journey. You know, start here, then here, and then here. 
Right, right. So, you know, I think the first place to start is to take a look at your environment, to take a really objective, you know, view of it and step into it and see, you know, what do you love in that space? And what is it that you don't love at all? Because that really affects a lot. In fact, I see a lot of times that people don't work in their office because they're not inspired in there. They actually will work out in the living room. They'll work out in their car before they'll actually walk, work in their office. So you have to actually create a space for the experience that you want to have. So if it's your office, you want to be inspired to be productive, to pick up the phone, to be able to you know, make money in there. And if it's in your bedroom, you want to be able to have a place where you rest. You don't want to have electronics in there. You want to look at you know, what's the experience you want to have in that space in your home, you know, in your kitchen. If you want to you know, have a healthy lifestyle, you don't want it filled with junk food. So you have to look at what is the environment that is actually pulling you towards the experience that you want to have there. So you have to, you know, really step outside of yourself. And I find that for people that, because it, you know, this really is a learned skill. I mean, there may be tendencies where people appear to be more organized and, and other people more scattered, but it's like anything. It's a learned skill. We weren't taught how to balance a checkbook in, in you know, school. We weren't taught how to organize. I mean, we weren't taught how to run relationships. I mean, these are all life skills that can be learned that aren't taught as normal part of living. And a lot of people feel like if, um, because they don't know how, they feel like there's some inherent reason that they should know how, right? It's almost like, you know, going to the gym and having a trainer. It's like, well, I feel like, well, I know how to do sit-ups and I know how to do push-ups. I should be able to be healthy, right? But it's really having those tips and skills to accelerate that to make it happen. So one of the first things that you can do is go into your space and see what is inspiring you, what is actually having you have the experience that you want to have in that environment and then get rid of everything else. Mm, that's a great, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. And then create, and then I imagine what, what, so then what would be step two on that? So on step two is you want to be able to have the things that you need in that space, you know, within a, a reachable different distance for you. So for instance, anything having to do with your project, you want to have, you know, either on your desk, cause that's the current project that you're working on or in maybe a labeled bin that has everything you need for that. What I find is that people will have things in like four different areas. And so not only are they wasting time, but they can't really focus on the project at hand because everything is scattered in a lot of directions. So for instance, if it has anything to do with your office, it should live in your office. It shouldn't be in your bedroom closet. It shouldn't be in the garage. It shouldn't be stacked up in your, in your kitchen. It shouldn't be all over these places. Have everything that you need at your fingertips because here's the thing. If it's a resource and you can't get your hands on it, it's actually not a resource to you at the time that you need it. If, you, if it's one of those, well, it's around here somewhere, if you can't get your fingers on it at the time that you need it, it's actually not a resource for you. So you need to have it in a system that actually supports you when you need it. And so, you know, it's important to really have the systems and structures in your place that support you in what you're doing in the moment. And so, again, it looks at putting things back where they belong, having them in similar places so that you can find them when you need to have them. Because one of the things that people don't realize is that you know, if you just lost five minutes a day, and it doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, some people spend five minutes looking for their keys or their cell phone or the paper that they just need as they're running out the door. Just five minutes a day quickly adds up to 30 hours a year. Well, with 30 mm -hmm. hours, I mean, what project could you complete? What vacation could you take with your family? I mean, those type of things about not being organized quickly add up and affect your life. Well, when you, when you add the numbers to it, it makes so much sense. Um, and, it, and I think you, you hit something really key is do it right then. You know, we, I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of it too, where we, we have something, we look at it. It could be a, something we got in the mail and it'll just sit on a counter and say, oh, I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. Well, next, I, I actually have a huge pile of papers sitting on my dresser that I am, you know, supposed to be filing away instead of when I get it in, I should be putting it in the folder file it's supposed to come in. So, right. a, a, and, and then I look at it now and it's just daunting. It's like, really? Right. So, you know what? I'm going to be spending, you know, a Sunday 
you know, <laughs> for at least an hour or two, right. figure, you know, getting all those into in place. And I love the way you put that where, what could I, what else could I be doing? Especially this is a gorgeous weekend right. uh, here in Dallas. You know, what else could I be doing? So, right. um, so I, I think it's like doing it right then and there, you know, yes. even like tell your kids when they drop their clothes, it's like, pick it up right then and there and hang it up <laughs> or put it in the, in the pantry. You're a parent, right. you know what that's like, right? Absolutely. So, well, you know, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, I call those open loops. Because if we have too many open loops that are happening, meaning too many completes, in fact, it was shared with me at one time that a, you know, everyone says they have all these projects that are going on. Well, a project is actually something that has a start and finish. If you don't actually finish something, it's actually not a project. It's just processes. And you have all these processes. And again, things that are running around in your head. So what happens is that it's actually better if you had, let's say you're meeting with clients, you met with them for like 45 minutes and you left that 15 minutes to have completion. You either sent that email off that you promised, you wrote something down that you needed to do, you filed the papers, you had actual completion because you're going to know more about what needs to happen in that moment. It'll save you time to do that because let's say you talk to you know, five to 10 people a day and you let all those open loops, I'll do it at the end of the day. It actually takes you more time because then you've got to recall what it was that you were going to do for them. You have to then, you know, put your mind back to what that was. But if you actually had more completions, you would be done at the end of the day versus adding an extra one to two hours at the end of the day, trying to figure out what you promised, you know, when you're most tired and not having that happen. So I think it's really important to actually have like even set a timer for 15 minutes because mm. people really uh, forget or, or haven't had the experience or haven't really had that happen where if you set 15 minutes, it's amazing what you can get done in 15 minutes. It's really a lot that can happen. And it's actually a fun game to do with kids as well, where if you just kind of go, okay, are you ready? Because kids like the game of it. You go, okay, we're going to do it in 15 minutes and we're going to put everything away. It's kind of like the cat in the hat where they put everything away before mom came home. Mm -hmm. It's that timer put your shoes away, hang up this, get the dishes done, put the papers away, you know, just this running around really quickly. And just doing that, you just feel better in your say in your space. And you have a sense of accomplishment, which we want to feel like we're winning every day. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like you can. And I noticed with you just working with you, getting you onboarded to be a host on, on the WN Podcast Network that, you know, you just, you had it going and you have that wonderful Carrie and others <laughs> to support you to get things done right away. I mean, that's another thing is, you know, you, you can't do it alone sometimes. Uh, and sometimes you might need to get some help to help to, it, especially I imagine if, if you're just listening to this or watching this right now and you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's so me. I don't know where to begin. Well, maybe you need to get help. Maybe you, you, you have Diane, uh, you, you know, Diane, it, you know, this is what she works with people on. She coaches people on this. Uh, she can help you do that. So sometimes you just need that help to just get you started. And then of course there's the maintenance, you know, to make sure you stay on track. So, uh, in sum up, I've got two, uh, very distinct one, one is clear your space and have only in your space what is inspiring to you. And the other is have things that you need at your fingertips. Put things in bins because like you say, if you need to, you know, whatever it is you need, say you need some kind of document or you need a, uh, a pen or any of those things that it's right there because if it ain't there, it's not convenient and, and it's, you know, it then creates chaos for you because then you've got to waste time finding whatever it is you need. So what would be number three? So, well, number three is actually the, the implementation of it. So it's, it's looking at your environment, you know, only having, you know, what inspires you and getting rid of everything else and then utilizing that 15 minutes to actually get it all done. And this is the part where people tend to drop off. I mean, people have experienced clearing the whole desk, clearing the space, but then, you know, one hour, one week, one month, you know, there's a new pile that's there. So having that, you know, 15 minutes um, really makes a, you know, a big difference to, to help you do that. So, you know, it's create, uh, you know, a space for the experience, the environment, because environment, you know, pulls you into the uh, experience you want to have. You don't want to rely on willpower. It's the environment. Two is what inspires you, you know, get rid of everything else. And then to leave 15 minutes at the end of each appointment to close the open loops. Okay. Very good. All right. Very good. Uh, 
this is a, a really good start uh, for people. Um, and uh, once you begin, you know, begun is half done. So mm -hmm. take take Diane's advice and uh, and you don't have to go out and be a prostitute like her to, to make things, to make this happen and figure it out. She's right there giving you the instructions and the guidance. So uh, Diane, thank you so much for, uh, for being here and you're, what a great story. And I uh, see so you never know where life is going to take you and look where it's taken you. You now have this, uh, you know, this thriving business. And, and I do want you to clarify when you talk about your spa, spa life before we go, Explain yeah. exactly what do you mean by that? Absolutely. Thanks, Phyllis. Thanks for asking. You know, so spa life is a lifestyle and it's a lifestyle that accepts the notion that you can have accomplishment and harmony coexisting together. So, you know, most people have had the experience of how you feel when you walk into a spa. You can actually just feel like you've just left the world behind. You have that ah feeling. It's just, you know, it's the experience that you have. And I want people to have that experience, that spa life ah feeling every day in their life in every room of their space and to be able to walk into each of the rooms have the office feel like it's a productive workspace to have your bedroom feel like it's a sanctuary where you can keep get deep sleep and your kitchen where it nourishes and connects with the family where you have the exact experience that you want to have created in each of the rooms and when those happen together you have created your spa life uh, beautiful. And, and really our personal life is, will reflect in our business. And so if we can get all those things, all those rooms you mentioned that might, you might say, well, that's my personal, but that's not my office. But if you can get it, they really both need to work, you know? So if you have an office and you actually go to an office space, yeah, you, you need to clear that out and have what's inspiring you, inspires you and do all that, but you need to do it at home too. I mean, don't you agree that they, the two mesh? Absolutely. I mean, it's almost more important to have your home space, you know, really it's kind of, you know, we talk about our home as being, you know, our sanctuary and our castle and however, a lot of people don't feel that way in their home. And so, you know, anything that can happen out in the world, you may not have, you know, input or control over, but we completely have control of what's happening inside our own space and in, um, you know, in our rooms and how we experience life. And so, you know, really it, it's that important. So if you, if you are feeling like you are scattered or overwhelmed or frustrated, you know, the first place to look is your space because it is impacting your daily experience each and every day. And if you have too many rooms where, you know, you're working out of your bedroom or, you know, you've got things from your kitchen that are, are sitting in on your dining room table. I mean, there's just this overlap in life that if you don't have those clear picture of how you want your experience in that room, you may not be having a clear picture and experience of what you want to have in your business because everything is a ripple effect and affects every aspect of your life. How can people reach you if they want that spa life today? Ah, well, they can go to my website at dianehalfman.com. And if people are really still wondering, well, I really want that spa life and I'm not sure how to do that, I really invite them to uh, either go to my website or go to the link that is the clutter awareness quiz, because in four minutes, they can actually look and see how, where they stand, because the first step is awareness and really knowing where they are in that. So if they go to the clutter awareness quiz.com, Again, that's the clutterawarenessquiz.com. They can, in four minutes, know exactly you know, what areas of their life are working and the other areas that they may need some more support in. That's perfect. And don't forget to tune in to Diane's podcast on the EWNpodcastnetwork.com. It's called Live Your Spa Life Show. Thank you so much, Diane. It's just been such a pleasure. And I've already have clarity thinking about all the things I'm going to do when I get home, especially <laughs> cleaning that pile of junk sitting on the top of my desk. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Phyllis.